I'm very excited to welcome tonight Leona and Rod to take us through a wine tasting. Folks, and uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, maybe just a quick disclaimer on this, that uh, I am not a sommelier and, and Leona neither is a sommelier. We just really enjoy wine as a couple. So we thought we'd share what we've learned along the way um, in our journey with you tonight. Um, I don't know, did you have a, another disclaimer you wanted to share with the folks? Um, before we share that disclaimer, my name is Leona Devin. I work at the VHL Alliance. Um, I run the um, uh, sometimes twice a month uh, support calls. And I am a VHL patient, and Rod is a... I'm a VHL caregiver, and I forgot to do the intro as well, too. My name is Rod Miller, and I am the uh, partner to, to Leona, and I'm a caregiver, and uh, also support the VHL Alliance through some activities that I do as well. Awesome. So Rod had his disclaimer. I have mine. No, I have ours. In addition to the previous disclaimer, I would like to say re, ro, we, Rod and I, do not have a dependency issue. We do not. Do we do want to have fun tonight and may make a, a joke or two about drinking copious amounts of wine, which is not consistently true. In all seriousness, we do acknowledge that alcohol dependency is a serious issue and our hearts go out to those who struggle. We in no way want to make light of their challenge. I have an additional warning in, uh, to add to that disclaimer. This is called wine and wisdom. There will be lots of wine and wisdom may or may not be present at any moment. Yeah, I'm kind of not sure where the wisdom came from. I, I wasn't ready for that either. I was like, that was all about the, and Heidi. All they, about the they wine. They were just, just trying to like entice us to doing this so we could share okay. all of our all goodness. Right. All right, so let's let's kind of talk a little bit about, uh, about some of wine basics tonight because uh, we want to share that with you before we get into some of the tasting. So, as we're doing this, we're going to watch the chat. So if you've got some questions, put them our way. Um, we may or may not be able to answer those chats, but uh, please we, please send them if you want to send them our way. So when we think about wine, from our perspective, wine is a lot of fun. Uh, there are many different regions across the globe where we can source wine from. Uh, wine in the world is grown usually between the latitudes of 30 and 50 degrees, both in the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere. And when you take that into consideration around the globe, there are enormous amounts of areas of the globe where we can actually purchase and grow and grow wine. So let's talk a little bit about what the difference is between a new world wine and an old world wine. So old world wine just signifies quickly that it is wine based out of Europe. That's primarily it. New world wine is wine that's based out of other areas in the town in the in the globe, including places like California, Australia. South Africa, Argentina, Chile, a lot of the new worlds. And here's one of the distinguishing features between both a new world wine and an old world wine. And old world wines normally are, are and they're based upon where they are grown. Whereas a new world wine is based upon the varietal. So for example, you may buy a Pinot Noir from Burgundy in France. The wine will come, it'll be a Burg Burgundy wine with the grape being a Pinot Noir. It'll have a name for it based upon the chateau or wherever the wine was, was grown. In California, you'll find a Pinot Noir from, I don't know, Poppy, which we're gonna taste tonight. They normally use their, their, uh, their name of the winery and the varietal that they're gonna be growing. So that's some of the things you need to know about old world versus new world wines. Wines are grown in two primary climes, either a cool region or a warm region. And the characteristics of the grape and the flavors of the grape are different depending upon when it's, whether it's warm or whether it's hot or, or cold. Did you know that? I knew that because I read the notes before we got on. She nailed it. She nailed it. However, there is one element to consider, and that is what we call the terroir. Uh, maybe that's not the right word French-wise. Terroir, terroir, which basically means soil. So every soil has a different composition of minerals and other agents in it that actually breathe into the wine or go into the wine. And an example for us was when we were in BC and remember, oh, sorry, British Columbia, for those who are not Canadian. Which is a province like a state. To the west of us, okay? Kind of like um, Oregon. Kind of like Oregon. So we went on a, a journey of wine tasting in uh, Southern BC in the Okanagan in, uh, in the summer. And in fact, we tasted a wine, and I can't remember where it was from, quite honestly, but I remember the wine had a very smoky taste to it. And we asked the winemaker, well, what happened? And, and they decided to keep the, the grapes from the year that there was an, an enormous fire in the interior of BC, 
which added to the flavor of the wine. So it brought out, it was a red wine, I think it was a Pinot, and it brought out the smoky flavors of that wine. Do you remember having that wine? Yes. What did you, you think about that? Do you remember I that? thought about cigars. That's what I thought about. <laughs> it was like drinking a mushed up wine cigar. She also loves pretzels in her wine. We'll get to that in a second. So let's talk a little bit about what we're going to do tonight. So we decided that we would share with you three very common types of, of wine. The first one we're going to share with you is a Prosecco from uh, Italy. And we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between Prosecco and Champagne and, and Cava as an example. We're going to share with you a uh, winery, again, from BC, a Chardonnay. And this is a cool region Chardonnay. We'll get into that in a minute. And then we're going to share with you a, uh, a poppy, Pinot Noir from Monterey County in California. And as I'm, yeah, I know, that's awesome. Yay. And as I'm standing here saying share with you, I'm sorry, you're not going to get a sample of any of it because it's us doing this thing together. We're legally obligated to drink three bottles of wine tonight because of this volunteerism. So Legal. thank you for this opportunity. Legal. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about storage. So, um, there's a couple of principles around storage that uh, are important to keep in mind. First and foremost, wherever you store your wine, it should be stored in a, in a dark, uh, dark room that's uh, um, absent of artificial light or of sunlight, uh, or stored in a place where it's cool and dry. Uh, and if you're gonna store your reds that have corks, always store it in whites that have corks, always store them on the side. It is not necessary to store wine on a side if it is capped. That's something new as well, too. So it gives you a bit more room to store some of your bottles. Uh, and then when you're done the wine uh, or you're in the middle of a bottle, there are a couple of other things to store the wines. So I'm going to throw that over to my partner to talk about some of the things that we do when we store our wines when they're not quite finished, which that doesn't happen very often, but sometimes it does. So um, particularly, um, I enjoy something bubbly. Yes, yes. sparkly. Yes, please. And um, I have Dutch heritage, so we like things, all things cheap. So Rod will talk about the price points around these bubbly, sparkly wines. These are nice, uh, light to drink. Um, and, but often what the problem is because they are, um, have uh, this bubbly quality or this effervescent quality, um, you feel like you're legally obligated to continue the whole, and drink the whole thing. Um, that is not the case. So uh, Rod is gonna talk about serving in a minute, but you wanna get a good stopper. And this stopper has these claws on it, which go around the, uh, I'm gonna call it a rim, but it's neck. not a rim. It is a neck. <laughs> I don't do details. Um, it goes around the neck of the bottle. And so that way you can put this on and it will keep for up to three days in your fridge. So you can have a little tiny sip, perhaps not with breakfast every day, but that will keep it nice and fresh. So we're good there. <clears throat> All the bottles? Yeah, sure. Yep. And then we have our regular wine. Wine and oxygen do not mix well. So if you've ever had a bottle of a red wine on the counter that you have not finished, um, when it is exposed to oxygen, the cork is out or the top is off, then it loses its deliciousness. So you want to keep oxygen away from the wine. So how do we do that? Um, oftentimes you'll see people just at a party and they'll store it with a cork like this. That's fine. It looks delightful, but it doesn't do anything to save uh, the integrity of the wine. So what you do want is, um, which I don't have. Hold on one second. This is super cheap. You buy it on Amazon. Um, $16.99 Canadian, which is about oh, $1.50 American. Absolutely. They're yep. probably giving it away right now. Probably. So this is just a rubber pliable uh, cork. And you pop it in the top of the bottle. And then what this does, you put it over the cork. And this sucks out the air inside your wine. And that will save its goodness for longer. So that is how we save those good things when we do not have the chance to complete it or share it with people because we are social distancing. <laughs> uh, one thing I would request is I'm more excited about you guys than I am about the wine. So if you wanna say hi in the comments and say where you are uh, coming from, then that would make my whole heart explode with effervescent mm -hmm. joy um, so that we can get a feeling because we can't see who is on the call, not like a regular, I'm used to the Zoom VHL people. So um, love to see you uh, on here. And then Rod will take it away and talk about more 
things wine. And awesome. I, I will continue to drink. <laughs> Thank you, I'm Mark. not supposed to be drinking right now because we're supposed to be tasting, but Thank you, I just like to prepare my palate. So there's two types of wines. There's still wines and sparkling wines. And so we're going to talk about serving, serving both of those. And then we'll go through an example of them all. So when you think about serving wine, the big question comes up is do you decant or no? Uh, in most cases, you don't need to, unless you're actually storing some of the bigger reds. You'll find in some of the reds and even in some of the whites, the longer term storage, there'll be a sediment. So the sedimentation needs to be removed before you serve it. Hence why we would decant a wine. Um, we also decant the wine because we love to have a little bit of oxygen start to mix in with the wine. That kind of kicks out the carbon dioxide. It kicks out the hydrogen sulfide to help your wine oxidate and breathe. We call that breathing when we're preparing for uh, preparing wine to, to serve. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about serving your wines. What do we talk about in terms of temperature? Well, what's, hey, Tampa. Yay, okay, we are hi, missing. Alex. You, we are missing your weather because it's it just started spring here. And I know Thank in Tampa. Thank you for coming, Alex. Sorry. Thanks for coming out. So let's think about uh, temperature for a second, too. So storage temperatures uh, need to be consistent, as, as we talked about in storage. But serving temperatures, you would chill a sparkling wine of any variety of, of sparkling wine. You would also chill a uh, chill a um, white wine. So like we're going to share with you a Chardonnay tonight. So even Pinot Grigio or Sauvignon Blanc, any of the whites, you would chill them as well too. But here's the interesting thing. We often hear that red should be served at, warm, at room temperature, which is in fact true. If room temperature was anywhere from kind of 58 to 62 degrees. And if you're in Canada and your furnace broke like ours did today, we are perfect wine weather right now we in are, our kitchen. We're currently freezing up here right now, but we're gonna make it through this. Uh, so a light chill on a deep red is not a bad thing at all to take it just below the temperature that you might be sitting in. Uh, from other reds, so if you think about Gamay's or you think about uh, Pinot Noir's, even your Merlot's, you can also chill those slightly more as well too. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about serving your different, your different wines. So I don't know about you, but are you ready to, ready to take on a taste? She's been waiting all day for these bubbles. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the Lamarck, oh, right, we gotta get that out of the cup. So our sparkling wine tonight is a is a, is a really nice, good value Prosecco. So Prosecco is an interesting wine. Prosecco actually originated out of the village of Prosecco in Italy. However, over the years, and I think it was the early 2000s or late 90s, I can't remember which, they actually renamed the Prosecco grape, because that's the grape that they used to make Prosecco, into Galeria. Galeria, I think is what it is. So now Prosecco stands for all sparkling wine from, uh, from Italy. So we're gonna have a little bit of Prosecco tonight. And one thing I love about Prosecco, it's an anytime drink. Um, mimosas for some, it is, uh, oh, Northern British Columbia. Thank you so much for joining us. I know, us. it's so exciting. We have some fellow Canadians. We love everyone because we are Canadian. So, but hi Dara, hi, uh, hey Lee's watching. Hi Dee, oh, no, and yeah. Sarge. Um, oh, a port person. Yeah, we were going to have port. Hi, hi. Hey, you know what? If if this is something you guys want to do, we'll do another we'll do another show. Except we'll take out the wisdom part because I'm not sure where that's coming into. Well, this. port and wisdom. We'll just port be and saucy and porty. Okay, so Rob so, is going to show you how to do this properly because this can increase stress in life. Yes. And with VHL patients, we have enough stress. Yes. Okay, go. So uh, the best way to grab this bottle is to grab the cork like that, hold the bottle, the neck of the bottle, it's hard to see this way, do it on an angle, and then just finally twist the bottle. And Dude. always hold on an angle, okay? Because then what happens is, you just get a little pop. Um, you may be in a restaurant and some uh, sommelier or some waiter serves you a sparkling wine or a champagne. Hi, Amanda. Hi, Amanda. And uh, gets the big pop. There's a marketing reason for that because they want to sell more bottles. You don't need to have a big pop when you crack open a bottle of Prosecco or Champagne. So let's take a minute and talk about Champagne. So this may be interesting for some, some may already know this, but if you're a sparkling wine and you're, you're a sparkling wine outside of France, outside of specifically the Champagne, Champagne region, you cannot call your sparkling wine Champagne. You can call it Method Champagne because it takes the old world method to do that but you cannot call it champagne. And here's a fun fact. 
This Prosecco is made out of the Prosecco grape. Champagne is usually made out of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir blended in some way together. So just so you know for knowledge. Okay, so we're gonna take this, we're gonna, we're gonna pour this and we're gonna try it for you. Now, I know you have a very special cup in your hand. Did you wanna share about that special cup? So this is my mom's glass. She had VHL, she was a de novo mutation, which we don't normally talk about when we're sharing glasses. But um, she got these on her wedding, passed away a number of years ago, well, a lot, long, long time ago. And we just got these back into us. So we drink this, this is called a coupe glass. This is a cool way uh, to drink um, something sparkly, but it's preferred by the connoisseurs to do a, a drink something bubbly in a long glass because then you see the effervescence go all the way up. But if you are super cool and like to go 1950s- Or classy or classy than a coupe glass. And these are coming very much in vogue. So when Marshall's reopens, or perhaps you can get them in Amazon, you will find these little numbers and you can drink Coke out of them if you want to. So All I'm right. doing this for the VHL mama and Rod is doing the super classy one. No, I think actually yours is classy than mine. Okay. Wait till we're three tastings in and then we'll decide who is super classy. I decided before this, Rod is the class, I am the sass. So as Leona mentioned, when you when you uh, pop a bottle of, of sparkling, uh, you should see some bubbles rising from uh, below into the top of the glass. And that's why we use longer stem glasses. Hi, and Katie. Longer glass and um, uh, thinner body glasses. Okay. So I don't know if you're joined us and you got wine in your hand, but I'd just like to take a moment to make a toast to the VHL um, I've had a chance to get to know you guys over the last couple of years, well, last six years. It's been an amazing privilege. Thanks for this idea to bring this together. And uh, we're here. Cheers. And here's to you. Cheers. It's important to look each other in the eye after you ching ching glasses, even though Rod didn't. But um, I was too excited. That's supposed that. to be really good luck. And now we're doomed. So, um, mm, well, we got the next one's ching ching. So we're not all doomed. You're Woo! free. Okay. So, what do you have with Prosecco? What's a great, what's a great, Food pairing with Prosecco. Well, that's pretty simple. Hi, Cameron. Now we're hey, really Katie. we're really sweating over here now. Hi, Katie. Hi, Cameron. Yeah. Cameron, Cameron knows more about wine I know. than so Cameron, both jump of us in, squared. Jump in. But just be nice because we're Canadians. So we'll just say sorry. So, like we said, for us, wine drinking is all about just having some fun and getting to learn and know different wineries, different winemakers. One of the things that we love to do when we travel in our wine in our wine tours is to hit what we call the small lot wineries. Wineries that you would not normally see uh, um, um, producing commercial style or commercial quantity wines. And so we'll have a chance to sit down with a winemaker, which is often the bottler, which is often like does everything in the shop and uh, just get to know them and get to know their history and their wine and then we'll, we'll bring them home. And remember those moments when we're with them. So when you're thinking about what's great with, um, what's great with um, okay. uh, Prosecco, or Siri just answer this. Siri wanted to get uh, in on this. Siri's, I think Siri's thirsty. So Prosecco is awesome with uh, anything, pretty much. As you're starting off your night, your dinner, it's great as celebratory as you know. When you think about things like uh, fish or um, an aperitif before dinner, a little wine and cheese, Prosecco goes great. It's a great way to start stimulating the palate to get ready for the other courses of the meal that are going on. So. That is Prosecco. I've told you about Prosecco and Champagne. Uh, Cava in Spain is the sparkling wine for Spain. And I am not gonna try to pronounce the grapes that are used in Cava, but I could send you to Google to figure that one out, which is what I'm gonna do. So- uh, Or don't, just stick with, or don't, just stick or just with the nice bottle Prosecco. of sparkling wine. Probably seven cents right now where you are from. Amanda loves Prosecco because you are a classy, classy girl. So. Um, Yay, moving on. So one other note on Prosecco. Uh, oh, she loves Cava too, but oh, we love awesome. you, but we just, yeah. One other note on uh, production. So the method, the champagne method, uh, uses a method where every individual bottle is uh, is yeasted. Um, it's quite a uh, quite a production. Uh, whereas other sparkling wines, the Charmat method is used where they do that in major vats. So just to point a little something there for you. Okay. Um, if you want to and I have to laugh because Rod said neither of us are sommeliers and we are not, but he has had some training and I just follow his lead. So with that, with that, let's, uh, let's scoot over.
to the white that we have available tonight. And this is a white, uh, it's a single vineyard Chardonnay uh, from Maverick Wineries. So the primary growing region in Canada is in Southern BC, uh, reminiscent to kind of, even to, to kind of Oregon and, and Washington state. Um, very hot, very dry. It's the Northern part of the, uh, I think it's called the Sonoran Desert. I can't remember. Anyway, that sneaks up into Canada. So for those of you who've always wondered, um, does Canada have deserts? And the answer is yes, we have deserts. And one day you'll be able to come here again. Yeah, yeah one day. We look forward to having you. We'll host one you. One day. Yeah. We'll host you. Uh, so Chardonnay is probably one of the commonest, uh, commonest grapes grown across across the globe. It's a very hardy grape as well too. So it can be grown in tough climates, and uh, you'll find them both in cool regions and in warm regions. Um, and again, as I, as I mentioned to you, Chardonnay is used in part to make champagne along with Pinot Noir in most cases. The other thing to think of, of, of this as well too is a Chablis from France is actually the Chardonnay grape. So again, going back to that nomenclature thing that we do between new and old world wines is uh, utilizing that old world versus new world technology. So in cool climates, the wine, a Chardonnay grape uh, brings more acidity to the flavor and to the palate. And that reminds us of some of the uh, varieties of um, apple and pear and citrus that comes out of the wine. So in the regions where it's warmer, the acidity is a bit more medium. And what we get out of that is more, um, oh, remind me, stone fruits, like peaches and nectarines and- Plums, no. Well, well, maybe. Plums more red wine. Sorry. Apricots. Sorry. That kind of thing. That <laughs> I kind of interjected thing. too early. Okay. Uh, so the Maverick, I'm gonna read this because I got this from Maverick today. Uh, the Maverick wine is grown in what is called a cool region of Canada because we're farther north between that 30 and 50th uh, parallel um, between Oliver and Asoyes in British Columbia. And I don't know how many wineries that we saw or went to, maybe we, sh we shouldn't share this because it's a lot, on our, between our honeymoon and our first trip to BC, wasn't it about 45 wineries we did tasting? tasting Only there? four a day. We were very, Only very well paced. Had four a day. So yeah. here you go. So we're going to take, we're going to take a choose, we're going to, uh, taste Maverick. So, and if so. you'd like, I can, uh, I can share this, uh, share these wineries with you if you're interested, uh, for your own future knowledge and you can Do search them out. I, I think you can. I don't know. Sorry for being, serving something so ex exclusively Canadian, seeing as our borders are closed, but you can find a Chardonnay and, um, enjoy it. And if you don't enjoy it, I'm going to show you how it, it can be enjoyed like a 22-year-old girl. So, <clears throat> Hey, so uh, I just noticed that us Canadians say sorry a lot. Did you say? We're doing that on purpose just We're so that purpose. we keep the tenderness and we don't build a wall. It's a, Yeah, and it's kind of the stereotype, right, that, yeah. that we have up here. Okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit about serving passes before we do this. We've, we've brought out a couple. So you've seen the long stem. Awesome for, awesome for champagne and Prosecco. We're gonna serve this in a standard wine glass. It's a Chardonnay standard wine glass. And we're gonna save the last wine for our Burgundian glass, also great for Pinot Noir. So we're gonna keep that there in case you're wondering why there's different glasses that are there. Okay, are you ready to try the Chardonnay? I'm are ready you ready it. if we try the Chardonnay? I'm ready. Oh, is it a citrusy or a buttery oh, shirt? Hi. We're gonna tell you after we like smoosh it around in our mouths and like swirl it on the counter. Because we're gonna demonstrate how to taste. Just a tiny bit. How we're gonna taste a wine. Uh, and you'll notice that we didn't actually taste, go through a tasting for the sparkling wine and that's intentional. Um, because we're not gonna, we're gonna do something a little bit different for this one. So why don't you <laughs> take them through the tasting? Yeah, no. no, just a second. Okay. She's we have to adjust the camera kids. Yeah. Get short. Rod and I are under five feet tall. Um, so first of all, you want to swirl the wine. I have no idea why we do this, but all the classy kids do. So um, I think this gets like more air into the wine and it's awesome. But regardless, if you're in a fancy restaurant, you don't know what to do. You don't like the person you're with, or you want to look super bougie as my children say, then you swirl these suckers. Number one, swirl the wine. Thank you. Good prompt. The next thing, no, maybe the first thing is you do, you know what, Rod, you should probably take over. No, no, keep going. You're doing great. Okay. 
You also want to take a note of the color. Now, obviously, this color just looks light yellow to me. Um, if you had 15 white wines lined up, then you could say this is lighter, or this is richer in color, or this is darker. So take a look at the color. It looks lovely to me, and it has no floaties, which is what I silently say when we're tasting wine. Then the next thing is you want to give it a good smell. So you stick your nose right into the wine, almost snort it up in a straw, but not quite. And then in all seriousness, you do make note of um, what you are smelling. What do you smell, Rob? I haven't tasted it yet. Oh, smell it. smell it. He's gonna smell it. Mm. So I, I get the, mm. I get the citrus on this one as well. It's kind of the Granny Smith apple type of. Do you guys have Granny smell. Smith apples? Mm -hmm. Tell us the truth. Um, okay. I get that. So Very if good. I don't know what I'm tasting, when we go to wine tastings, I always say I sense a hint of honeysuckle because that sounds super smart and That's I've never, point. ever, ever even come within social distancing levels of honeysuckle. However. So we did that actually at one winery. And the funny thing was the winemaker said. Oh, you can put the, you can also place the wine glass against a white sheet of paper to see the color better. I sure can. Or against this person's face who has never seen sun since last September. Um, so she, she, so she did that at a winery and she says, yeah, I detect honeysuckle. And the winemaker goes, you know, not many people notice that in this wine. That's very good. Because I am more sensitive than most and very, very classy. Then when you're tasting it, you also, you want a little, some air in your mouth. So once you have it in your mouth, you want to draw in a little bit of air, like you're sucking in through a straw. Rod likes to make a noise while he does it. I'm a lady, so I don't make a noise. So I mm. smoosh it around mm. a bit so you get it through the palate. Your tongue picks up different tastes and then see what you notice. I love that. So I get the I get orange in that, and I get a little bit of I get a little bit of nut. It's also that buttery kind of. Oh, Heidi, full we're feel. swinging both ways. We have buttery and citrusy because Canadians like to accommodate all tastes. We do. We do. Oh, do you prefer a stem or stemless glasses? Oh, and does it make a difference a for the taste? Question. So Leona uh, likes stems, question. but I don't know. It's just a visual preference to me. Um, I noticed that all of our children who are grown adults and are of legal drinking age have stemless, but that's because I think they drink more and they spill more. And there is a, that's a good question. Though. Okay. That's a good point. Um, holding a stemless glass can actually heat the wine up. Not a lot, but, but enough. So I prefer to have a, a stem glass. That's my call. Okay. So, um, that's the only political comment we're going to make tonight. Totally. Stemmed or no stemmed. Otherwise very okay. apolitical. We have nothing to say about anything going so, on. So I'm curious with the group that's here, um, what do you pair your Chardonnays with? When you have a Chardonnay, what kind of foods do you like to have, have with the Chardonnay? Leona actually wants to know what kind of white wine you like. Because we, in all honesty, don't normally drink Chardonnay. Red should do stems. They don't heat the wine with your hand. Oh, okay. Good to know. I like it. Um, Thank you, Heidi. So I, so I, uh, I, I think of a Chardonnay as that really kind of go-to white for anything related to um, a lightly roasted pork, a roast chicken. For those who like white versus red, uh, turkey is great. It's a pair with turkey. Um, That's a good fat shard. I don't know. So Cameron just says he likes an unpacked shard, and we do too. Oh, that's what I thought. <laughs> I just was. whispered to Rod in my ventriloquist voice, "What's an unpacked shard?" So thank you. We Cameron. thought that by the way, Cameron. Thanks. Is this I, oaked or unoaked? Uh, this is unoaked. So I like this too. I like it too. The oaky taste can kind of be a little bit too much. Um, when having a chardonnay, though, it's also consider staying away from things that have very strong 
flavors? Absolutely, Amanda, with creamy dishes. So think fettuccine Alfredo, uh, think risotto. Uh, those type of dishes are awesome with the, with the Chardonnay. Does a pizza count? Because of the richness. Written, uh, you know what? Um, yeah, you know you could do it with you could do it with pizza unless it's a this spicy. This is where Rod is all serious, is a and I'm like, pizza. okay. Better fruit expression plus the new world trend is to be over oaked. Yeah, we yeah, don't do new call, world Cam. trends. Yep, yeah, we're absolutely. old here. Yep, Canada. Absolutely, totally agree. Good to have good to have good to have you on board to make sure that we're saying the right things. So. Whoo! We need some checkpoints here. We could go totally rogue. Totally. So that that's uh, that's Chardonnay. Um, Anybody, any comments on what you like about Chardonnay's? No, or white wine. We don't, we don't. We or white wine or? Hungry now. Yes. We just ate because in our land. Oh, and maybe yours, Amanda. It is dinner time. Yeah, totally. What's your favorite white wine? We would love to know. We often actually do not drink Chardonnay's. We drink Pinot Gris. We, we drink Pinot Gris or Sauvignon Blanc usually. Yeah. yeah. So I have a little not so classy trick. If you, well, Okay. Sometimes classy. So if you are hot, we know that Amanda comes from um, Las Vegas, bless her. Um, we've got Alex from Florida. So if you want to make your wine last longer or you get some wine and you're like, dang, we bought this bottle. It's okay, but it's not my favorite. Then add some ice, add some club soda or sparkling water and mix that in. It's called a spritzer. It is delightful. Great way to be able to dilute your wine, get a little extra hydration, and it tastes love. And now Amanda is keeping us in suspense. My favorite pairing ever is, who knew that all these VHL people were such shrinkers? I was gonna say, Spicy ah, Thai with totally, yeah, mm. totally. So a nice, a nice example of a uh, sweeter wine, sweeter varietal from um, uh, Germany, and uh, with something spicy. That is such a nice compliment. So beautiful. Another one uh, is a Gewürztraminer. Yes, oh, and you can make a slushy. I like a slushy. Cool. That would be delicious. Um, that. Uh, you know what I'll be doing after we got off camera? Slushies for Leona. Yes. Yeah. So, so here's a question for folks that I've always been curious about. If you do this, um, maybe we'll figure it out. But I used to. I love sushi, and I never know what wine to have with sushi. So, if anyone's got some insight into what to have with sushi, that would be awesome. I'm kind of thinking, Hi, Lisa. I'm kind of thinking a gourd meter maybe, or a Riesling, I guess it depends on what you're having, but any insights on that would be awesome. All right, so um, you guys ready for the next one? But we're looking at our comments. I'm not being- um... Are there questions there that we, gourd stuff. Nice, yep. beautiful. Yep. Yeah, I'm looking at your comments down here. I'm not trying to, I'm not like checking my own Facebook messages. Okay. So we get to go on to the third? Yes. Now we're legally obligated to drink a lot of wine. Thank you. Thank you, Josh, for asking us <laughs> tonight to do that. Might we'll be, be calling in. We'll be back next Wednesday All right. for our repeat. So let's get into, into this one. Okay. Cam may, may know this one, actually. Cam may know yeah, this one. Yeah, know this one. So the next one we're going to do is we're going to uh, we're gonna look at Poppy from Monterey County. Uh, <laughs> We were, oh, wait, sorry. I can't take out the cork when I'm ducking though. We'll figure it out. Hey, you're pretty good in there. All right, uh, so we're gonna we're gonna crack open the poppy from uh, from Monterey County. That's and so we got we got introduced to this wine at a wine tasting about two years ago. Yeah. And uh, we loved it. And we decided, well, we're gonna buy a case. And so here's an interesting kind of story about decanting and not decanting. I wouldn't normally decant a Pinot. I just wouldn't. I just don't. Think it's necessary to do that but we uh we had a wonderful wine tasting the wine was beautiful and then uh bought a case home and opened up the first bottle at home and i didn't either aerate with an aerator amazon or decant and so we started to drink it and you could really tell it kind of had that kind of sulfury taste to it so um i mean it settled after a while uh but I think this is one of the this is one pinot Noir that I definitely would decant. I think with any other kind of the bigger pinots that are that are heavier or full more full bodied, uh, decant is not a bad deal. So we aerate this wine tonight before we drink it, um, and uh, and share our thoughts our thoughts with you. So, so while we're doing that, do you want to do you want to share some of the notes? Do you feel like sharing some of the notes on pinot Noir while I'm doing this? 
Okay, so I'm not prepared for this presentation. Because um, she's awesome. So Pinot Noir, unbeknownst to me until this very second, is known as the heartbreak grape. And I'm not sure why we constantly then share it in our marriage, but we'll talk about that <laughs> offline. Um, the name is earned because Pinot Noir is challenging to grow and That's produce, so like a good relationship. The name translates to pine black, and this is having a pine straw look. Pinot Noir is a traditional light body, dry, red, with low tannin levels and high acidity, and it makes it very drinkable for all occasions. Every Wednesday from National Eternity. <laughs> Pinot Noir is the grape used in most red wines from the Burgundy region in France, and is grown in a variety of locations across the globe. But I know that you see this actually being poured. We just got some feedback that things are a little uh, choppy and we apologize for that. We cannot see that it's choppy on this end, but we hope that has been figured out. So Rod is going to show you actually how to taste a wine, the really smart and trained way, uh, unlike the way that I've just picked up by watching really smart, super classy people in restaurants, including my beloved Rod. Whom I just absolutely adore you. Um, oh, and Sarge suggests sake with sushi. Oh, Very good call, sake. Sarge. Nice. Yep, good call. Okay, so there's a uh, Pinot, you know, nice light, uh, not a lot there, but a lighter, a lighter red, uh, more of a ras, kind of a raspberry cherry color, which kind of speaks to the kind of fruit that you get in a Pinot as well, too. Sometimes so, you'll notice that some wines are like purpley in colors, are. They got this. that garnet kind of look to it, right? So. Yeah. So it's really enjoying the color of your wine is also a delicious way to savor it. Okay, so this is, um, all right. So similar to what Leona did, what I do is I normally take, scroll for a few minutes, uh, or not a few minutes, maybe, maybe 30, 40 seconds. And then I take a short kind of inhale to really get a sense of what the nose is. And what I'm starting to kind of sense, and I, I'm really sensing a lot of that kind of, uh, uh, red fruit, so like a like a raspberry or a cherry. I like that. Cherry. Cherry, definitely cherry. Definitely cherry. That one more of a cherry than raspberry. And then I then I'll take a little sip. And swirl around the mouth, including all of the, the tongue, to get all the flavors in. Uh, and then I'll take a second sip, and then I'll bring in the air. which helps kind of burst up the flavors a bit in your mouth. Oh, that's really good. I got a little bit of chocolate in there. Got a little bit of chocolate, a little bit, a little bit of spice too. Nice little spice. Spice and chocolate, not heavy tannins, and you're not gonna find heavy tannins in Pinot, not in the lighter Pinots for sure. Definitely more tannin in um, in the Cabernets and in the, in the Bordeaux blends that you would see. And that's often why you you bend a, a Cabernet with something softer like a Merlot or even a, even a Cab Franc, which is down a, a bit from Cabernet Sauvignon, to help offset that tan and help lengthen that finish into the wine. And so it's got a nice finish. I like this one. I can still, I can still feel it on my tongue. We like so, to linger. A little bit of cherry, black cherry coming in there, a little bit of chocolate, a um, little spice. You see a little spice I feel on the palate. And a nice, a nice longer finish with that one. So, so here's what I, so, so uh, Leona mentioned about the heartbreak, heartbreak grape and where that comes from is the Pinot Noir skins are extremely thin. So they're really hard to, to uh, produce number one because of the thin ends and they're kind of temperamental. So they require some heartening around the different climates that they're in. And uh, then when you pull them, uh, again, you got to be careful you don't break the skin. So they're very de they're very delicate wine, uh, a grape, and that's why it, they're often called the heartbreak grape. Um, but people who produce Pinot, really good Pinots, are produced well. And so I would definitely say if you got a Pinot from, uh, uh, well, if you got a Burgundy wine for sure uh, across France, Pinots in Oregon are amazing. Pinots in California are incredible. And if you ever have the opportunity to have a Pinot Noir from Southern BC, they're also very, they're very good. And there are a lot of award-winning wines in Southern BC. And that's because that climate in that very small area of BC is perfect for growing some very nice reds, including Pinot Noir, as well as Cabernet. And if you ever have a chance to travel through BC, let us know. 
we'll hit you up with some wineries, connect with a couple of winemakers, and uh, you'll just really enjoy the journey because it's great, great value in Canada. So that kind of that kind of takes us to um, the end. What I would pair Pinot Noir with is it's everything. <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. Breakfast, lunch. So. Uh, sausages at breakfast for sure. I would do that, but not necessarily just eggs. But that's just what I'm saying. But that's if you Rod is classy. Okra oh, again, wines rock. Yeah. Thanks, man. Um, so I would definitely look at it. So when you think about Pinot Noir, if you're thinking about wines to serve at, let's say, Easter uh, with with a turkey, or you've got um, or you've got a ham going on, and you want to have some wines with that, or you've got a light roast going on, um, Pinot Noir is just a great wine to serve. It's likable by everybody. It's uh, it's incredible from a flavor profile perspective. It's not nearly as heavy as a Cabernet or a Bordeaux blend, which you want to have for those really kind of meaty meats and the grills and, and the steaks and things like that. But Pinot has such versatility around it. And, you know, but honestly, from our perspective, it's just a great deck drinking wine. We'll grab a bottle and we'll sit on the deck and, and enjoy that and um, others as well, too, because we have a lot to drink tonight. It's going to be a hard day tomorrow. So I just want to add this. This was not planned ahead of time, so... I hope you can handle this. Um, for those of you who like rosé wine, which I love rosé, um, sometimes uh, people who don't know, and that was me probably about 22 months ago, um, we I thought that, I don't know, rosé was just pink wine. Um, rosé, for example, is often a Pinot Noir grape. And I love this little saucy thing that they talk about when you go to visit vineyards is that they say it has like two hours of skin contact. And I'm like, I don't know what that means, but don't go into any greater detail. <laughs> so skin contact means that they throw the grapes in there and um, with the skins on, and then they pull them out after they've had two hours of skin contact. And that's what makes a rosé. So people often think, oh, rosé is a really sweet wine. I don't want to drink rosé. Rosé is a wonderful, wonderful wine to pair with a number of things. Um, and so I just thought that was a fun fact about Pinot Noir. Often actually you are, are drinking a just a very, very light version of a red wine. So not high in sugar and tastes delightful in all sorts of situations. Um, um, yeah, so that's my little that's rosé great. edition. So let's, let's take that further. Let's talk about what is a really great summer red to have. So Pinots are awesome. Um, Rosés are great because they're, they're usually reds. Um, Gamets. So I got introduced to, my well, let me tell you, because the Gamets, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, I got introduced to a Gamay Noir when I lived in Ontario, which is another wine region here in Canada. Which above Scots, Boston. Above Boston. Like right across the pond from Rochester. And um, I got introduced to the Gamay grape for the first time. And uh, did not realize then, that was a long time ago, that that was actually the Beaujolais grape out of France. And so the Gamays are a young varietal wine that are that are served chilled. Uh, they're not good for long-term storage, um, but they are great summer red drinking wines. It's like it's like drinking a really good juice. I don't know. I can't find the word, but it's just like really good. Uh, a really good feeling red wine for the summer. So if those of you who like reds, but don't like to drink reds in the summer, I would encourage you to try a Gamay or a Beaujolais. And I would encourage you to try that chilled as I would encourage you to try a Pinot Noir, a light Pinot Noir chilled as well, because it just really bursts, uh, the flavors just burst out. So that was, I wanted to add that as well too. Is there any other, hey, um, I know anything else you want to share? Not about wine. Um, okay. And if we drink too much, we'll be sharing too much. So is there, and I hesitate to ask this question because um, we don't know all the answers, but <clears throat> there might be other people on here that do know the answers. So if you have any questions or comments or feedback as we stand here, I wish we were on Zoom so we could hear your beautiful voices. Um, I don't know actually what I'm talking about, but when I used to go to the States, I would always buy, and this is for you, Josh, a shout out to Josh, a bottle of Josh wine. It was a good price point. 
I don't always know what I'm tasting when it's late at night and I'm tired, but it was delightful. And I have a baby named Josh, so it was extra awesome. So to the Joshes of the world who do lots for VHL and Heidi, I have yet to find a wine that's named after you. But if there was, I bet you it would be absolutely amazing equally. So that's all I got to say. So here's a thought, because um, we've got a bit of time left. It, share share in the chat, what is your what is your absolute favorite wine? Yes. Even if it's just a grape, I'd love to hear. I'd love to hear. Ooh, oh, support. and Sarge. Yeah, Sarge, we have a bottle of Taylor Flatgate downstairs. So if we were ever we allowed to get together, we could share it. Um, but right now we have a big border and a COVID virus that is preventing all connections. I even feel a little uncomfortable standing this close to Rob, even though we've been socially isolating together for a month now. About six weeks, totally. <laughs> That's why we're drinking and the wine. I just want to say how grateful I am that we have 15 to 14 to 16 to 10 people on here. That's awesome. Um, thank you for coming to our kitchen. Next time we'll cook like macaroni and cheese. Hey, maybe that we could do it next time. We could just do a wine pairing with something to eat. A Jack Russell. Of course oh, you did. Oh, there was wine with a Jack Russell Terrier on it? I'd love to That's see that. awesome because we're very inclusive. Okay, so my favorites, Amanda, we're ready. Ah, oh, Brotherhood. Ah, I'd, I'd love to try them. Look, look them up. What kind of grapes, uh, or what kind of wines do they make, Amanda? Or Alice, is that, no, Allison. Allison. What kind of grapes? Oh, sweet wines. Okay, enjoy the rest. That's great. All right. Love all wine, <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> That's my kind. Of, we should have a we should have a Zoom Albanero. call, Cameron, you and I. Albanero just talk about white wine. wine. Albanero white wine. Okay. Nice. Yeah. All right. Oh. What's that one? I miss. Maria Spaxis. Is that Spanish? Is that Spanish, Amanda? Oh, did you say you love Cameron? Cameron, did you say that you like, uh, Cameron, did you Tempranillo. Say, Tempranillo, thank you. Because uh, you can't talk, Cameron, but you can add any notes you want. I myself am a fan of Tempranillo. Great flavor and great price point. Yep, yep. No, not all grapes are sweet. Certainly not. What what red ones are sweet? I don't I have never drank a sweet wine in my life. Ah, uh, no. Hawk, oh, Spain. Thank you. Hawk Teller. Yeah. Hawk Teller. Yeah. I'm a dry fan myself. Nice. Hey, I love that idea. We should totally zoom taste. I'd be up for that. Spain. Spain has some beautiful, be beautiful wines. France and Italy are known uh, for their wines, but Spain is an amazing, amazing. Yeah. We just had a Romanian red wine, which I have no idea what it was called. It was amazing. Oh, Syrah from Australia. Uh, now you're going to get Amanda. You're going to get him started. I'm just saying. So, Amanda, not only do I love uh, Syrah from Australia, but if you've ever had a Pinotage from South Africa, it'll blow your mind. I'm a huge Pinotage fan. We don't get a lot here in Canada. Um, so I've got Is that to order. similar to Syrah? It, it's, it's, no, it's kind of more, I mean, the Syrah from Australia has a very specific taste profile to it. It reminds me a lot of when I have a Pinotage from South Africa. Yeah, that's it. That's exactly right, Cameron. Resi residual sugars. Yeah. yeah, that's what happens. Yeah, what comes to mind here is a Naked Grape. Um, they have those? Barefoot. Um, those are wines that are mass-produced and often a lot a lot of sugar in them. Hey, listen, let's talk a little bit about carb count. Remember? You remember that stuff? Yeah. So much. yeah. I mean, so okay. I just dropped a hint and I just... So, got... so you can... Just I don't remember the numbers, so you do. Yeah. 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 Um, so, um, some people are concerned about the sugar content. Cameron said that they add some residual sugars. For the most part, um, dry white uh, and red are um, low in sugar content, uh, quite low in carbohydrates. And the good news is that these little like happy what? folks are about half. Well, so yeah. I'm not saying you should drink twice as much, but um, if you do, we don't judge here. And um, that is some some goodness about knowing that you're not getting that extra sugary piece. Um, loved blue-eyed boy Shiraz from Australia. Okay, yay, good, good pointers. Awesome. 
So I find that the that the Shiraz from Australia, which is actually replanted Syrah vines in Australia, which is an old world wine transplanted in Australia, have an amazing, incredible robustness to them. And it always hits me as the very, they're very peppery. Like they've just got this really huge kind of pepper profile to them. Very good. Molly, Duker, Shiraz is great. Yay, see, well, you guys are like all professionals. This is awesome. You guys got this going down. You guys this got is this so going great. Down. So, so great. Um, any other final, any other final words before we? No, we're not going anywhere. Okay, we're not uh, going, okay. <clears throat> Following her lead now. <laughs> <coughs> oh, Shiraz from Australia. Nice. So. Yep. Awesome. Yeah, so Shiraz is known for its peppery notes. Mm -hmm. So it goes great with some nice steak on the barbecue. Yep. Roast beef, uh, very peppery. Not something that you would be able to consume as quickly as one might pinot, you know, which is, can be a blessing sometimes. So maybe we take a moment to talk about the peat, like we talk about the red kind of spectrum. Let's thing. do that. Okay, so <clears throat> thinking of reds from light to kind of full robust reds, and I'll <clears throat> and I'll point a couple things along the way. So as I talked about that kind of that Gamay grape, that red um, Beaujolais grape is is a light red, very easy drinking. Virtually zero tannins in a, in a gamay, uh, just great flavor. Less headaches okay. the next day. Less headaches the next day. We move up into the Pinot Meunier and into the Pinot Noir, uh, which is kind of that, they could be light, but more mid, uh, mid, mid bodied um, uh, red wines, slightly chilled as I talked about. Great flavor profile, not huge tannins, but really good, just an everyday drinking wine. Moving up, and the Merlot, I kind of classify that in there too. That's kind of my own personal kind of preferences. I see Merlot and, and Pinot Noir kind of in the same area. And then you move into the Cabernet. So Cabernet Franc, um, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, into those kind of bigger reds that have that really kind of robust fullness to them. But they also come with that tannity taste, which is given by the skins, right? So in the maceration skin process, contact. lots of skin contact, and that gives off the tannin. So what you'll often find and the bigger reds is they're gonna they're gonna offset them with something that's a bit lighter, usually Merlot. So Cabernet and Merlot is a, is a very normal pairing. Cabernet, Cabernet Franc, not as much. Um, what we see now though is is a lot more Bordeaux type blends in North America. Whether you're in California or you're in Southern BC, that Bordeaux blend, which is a mix of up to five defined grape varietals, and I'm trying to remember them. Might need your help, Cameron. Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, Merlot, um, Cabernet Franc, Petit Verdot, and one other, can't remember. But those, we're starting to see more blends happening in some of the New World wines to help with that flavor profile and to look for different varietals. That is what you would see as a very heavy, heavy full-bodied reds. So again, not, not the best wine to drink on its own because it just doesn't do justice to the wine. Um, adding those to particular different flavor profiles of different types of, of menus really brings out the wine in those very, very deep, deep blends. So that kind of talks to, to, the, to the red profile. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not as educated on the whites as I am. I, I tend to prefer, if I'm drinking a light summer wine, I'd be really happy with a Pinot Grigio or Pinot oh, Gris. Malbecs. Uh, Malbecs, yeah, Malbecs too. Uh, I'd be really happy with a Pinot Gris or a Pinot Grigio um, as a light kind of deck wine. I don't drink a lot of Riesling. I don't drink a lot of Gewurz demeanor. I do like my Sauvignon Blancs. I'm a particular fan of the Marlborough region in New Zealand because they really have some some highly flavorful um, Sauvignon or Sauvignon Blancs out of out of, uh, out of that region in New Zealand. Um, and then I. I I like Chardonnays, but not oak Chardonnays, un-oak Chardonnays. I find the oakiness too much, but a really good Chardonnay, um, un-oak with a buttery taste in it. I love that with a meal, like roasted chicken or turkey, like the whole Easter thing or Christmas thing we talked about. And that's kind of what I like in my in my white grapes. Um, and I, I tend to stay with that. I, uh, I like to try different wineries that has those grape varietals in them because that's my go-to. Um, but I do love a good Pinotage. I'm a big fan of Pinotage out of South Africa. If you can have one of those, man, those are really nice wines. 
kind of similar to the Pinot Noir, um, but a very different profile of taste. I'm uh, reading that uh, we have some, whew, Amanda, Amanda has taken level level two sommelier training. Hey, so nice, Amanda. Thank you for your grace. Uh, Rod's level one. Uh, Malbec from M Mendoza. Um, Amanda said, which you can all see, but it's just all news to me. And Alex, yeah, recovering from surgery. Oh, um, yeah. yeah, and missing your wine. Maybe just, I'm not one to influence people, but just uh, and then you can cork it and then just, you know, drink it over the month. Um, yeah. Um, I think what I appreciate about wine, not only all this goodness that we've talked about, is it really reminds me like good coffee is something mm -hmm. that I really savor. It's something that I sit down and enjoy and really just try to be in the moment and present. And the beautiful thing about the more you savor it and the more present you are, I feel like um, uh, that's a good thing in and of itself. Uh, to be very present. And um, I know as VHL patients and caregivers, our lives can be very stressful and with everything going on in the world. Um, but also, uh, to be honest, I also drink less because I'm just like trying to be in the moment and really savor the experience, the person I'm with, the people I'm with. Um, so that's that's why I really enjoy the wine. I concur. I, I love the fact that we kind of get to explore, but it's also a great sitting there on the deck or on the couch, having a conversation with each other, enjoying a wonderful glass of wine and just um, connecting. I love the savoring that wine brings. So um, do you have anything else you want to share or is there anything else coming in? Um, somebody just said they wish they had joined from the beginning and that there was a transcript. <laughs> I'm kind of glad there isn't because heaven help us all. Um, however, because this is a Facebook Live, I think it just stays up on the VHL Alliance pages and amongst all the groups. So if you do want to rewatch it, then um, that would be awesome. And if you have any questions about wine or savoring or being present, um, <laughs> because that's my other, yeah, the psychology piece, um, then having nothing to do with wine, then we would love for you to post your comments below and we'll check in and have uh, Josh or Heidi uh, let us know if there's any additional comments or um, questions that we are missing. We are super excited to have been asked by the VHL Alliance awesome. Thank you. to have wine in our kitchen. And now we are obligated to drink three bottles of wine, except not tonight, because I told you about the little storage tricks, although some might be drank and enjoyed. So. Hey, and listen, if you're interested in doing a, a wine tasting where we can all just get together and taste, I would be all over that. So we'll leave that with Josh as well, too, and that might be an opportunity. So thanks, everybody. Oh, I appreciate Josh. your time tonight. We're, no, we're not so going much. anywhere until Josh like, yeah, actually, actually pitches us off the call. Well, I just right. wanted to once again thank you guys, Leona and Rod, for joining us tonight, sharing some wisdom. Definitely next time you'll have to share some actual wine. Um, but for, for everybody else who's watching at home, I just want to in, invite you to join us for more events in our Surviving and Thriving Together series. You can find them all at vhl.org slash together. Uh, as well as uh, video recordings of all the events. Uh, awesome. Le Leona and Rod, thank you again so much for taking the time and joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Up. Thanks so much. Cheers Bye. to you. Cheers. Salud. <laughs> Salud. Thank you, everyone, everybody. for coming. Take care. I know your time Thanks is precious. So Take thank care. Thank you. Good night. Thank you for coming to our kitchen for the night. Stay safe, and we'll see you next time. Okay. You got it. See you.